please join me in welcoming Ellen DuBois and Julie Sook. Good evening. I'm so happy to be here this evening to discuss Ellen's wonderful, brilliant, and beautifully written book uh, on the uh, long battle for the vote. And um, I wanted to begin by perhaps inviting Ellen to say a few words um, about writing the book uh, and the process of writing the book and its importance today uh, in 2020. Uh, and then I have a long list of questions and we'll get into conversation. Not so long, very precise. Um, well, I've actually been working on this subject for uh, 50 years, um, uh, but I knew I needed to write a book for the 100th anniversary. And when I started to write this book, I thought, oh, fabulous. It'll coincide with the first woman president. Not to happen. Instead, it has coincided with um, Arguably, I'm going to get a little political here, but I think it'll work. Um, the greatest set of threats to American democracy since the Civil War. All right, I know you all agree. Um, and, uh, and the story of suffrage has lessons for us or inspirations for us in the incredibly enduring and, to quote someone, persisted persistence of these suffragists, three generations, uh, and uh, the model they give us of the determination of an active citizenry to expand and to protect and to defend democracy because it doesn't just exist on its own. So with that, I look forward to Julie's questions. Great. Well, I wanted to begin uh, by thinking about the long battle, actually. Why did it take so long? Uh, yeah, um, I think I didn't really come to a conclusion about that until I had finished the whole book, because I've sort of taken it for granted. Um, I've always known it took 75 years. And writing the book, I made sort of two conclusions. One is that it could have taken longer. Um, it, it, it sort of squeaked by in a certain way in 1920. We could have taken as long as the other great historical bastion of democracy, France, which didn't enfranchise its women till World War II. Um, but uh, when I tried to think about why it took so long, the pattern over the years seemed to me to be that um, the political parties, especially the established political parties, uh, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, were, uh, were the, the leadership, the central figures were opposed, were not going to support women's suffrage. They weren't going to support it because unlike, say, the enfranchisement of former enslaved men after the Civil War, neither party could count on the votes of women. They were, un first of all, they would be spread between the parties. Secondly, they would be unpredictable. Some people thought the women's vote would be too conservative. Some people thought the women's vote would be too liberal. But in any case, it was not predict, it, it couldn't be predicted. And for that reason, um, at the beginning of this story, in the 1860s, it's the party then, the more reform-minded and progressive, the Republican Party, it's a different Republican Party. The Republican Party um, would not let women's suffrage pass. And at the end of this story, the reform-minded and more progressive party, the Democratic Party, Woodrow Wilson's party, would not let it pass. So uh, in both cases, it was not merely the more conservative elements of the society, but in fact, um, political leaders who have reputations for being uh, progressive-minded, who I think can be credited with, um, in other words, I'm saying the opposition was fundamentally political. Well, one of the things that I think um, you discussed beautifully in terms of the women who fought 
uh, for the right to vote, uh, is the problem of uh, how do you get the right to vote without the right to vote, <laughs> right? Uh, that is, uh, you need money to make money, you need the vote to get the vote. <laughs> Uh, and, and I wondered if you could say a little bit about what's, what the specific challenges were uh, for, from the standpoint of the women who fought for it, how their exclusion actually prolonged the battle, and what they did to try to overcome that, their strategies. Well, actually, the truth is one of the, um, one of the things I want people, one of, there are many things I want people to take from the book. There are a lot of great details and a lot of great characters. But what I want people to know, and you in New York probably know this, is that there were women who had the vote before women had the vote. Now, how can that be? That is because the US Constitution is um, ambivalent about control of the vote. The, the US Constitution has very little to say about voting. It says that uh, Congress can make laws regarding the time and place and manner of voting, um, but it says nothing about who is to vote. And then, at the time of the writing, and now, in our own time, it is the states that control voting. We know that because the um, scourge of voter suppression with which we are dealing comes from state governments. And the federal government has, especially now with the, uh, with the um, repeal of the crucial parts of the voter, uh, Voting Rights Act, um, the federal government has very little authority over voting. There are three subsequent constitutional amendments, the 15th, the 19th, and the 26th, which designate certain specific groups who have federal protection. The first, the 15th, uh, people uh, uh, that, that um, the, the uh, states are not allowed to disfranchise on the basis of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Even when it was passed, the 15th Amendment was understood to be a very weak read because um, it, 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 it named specific disfranchisements and as time passed very quickly within um, uh, a decade, uh, southern states had figured out what are called surrogates for um, disfranchising African American men. So they weren't going to disfranchise them on the grounds explicitly of race, but that their grandfathers couldn't vote. That was the grandfather clause. Or that they couldn't interpret the Constitution uh, to the satisfaction of election officials. That was the literacy test. Uh, so the other two amendments, one that um, um, prohibits states from interfering with the right of anyone to vote on the basis of what was called sex, and the other, and I actually, I forgot to look at the actual language of the 26th Amendment, which lowers the voting age to 18. These both are very limited and leave, continue to leave the right to vote. Oh, I've gotten off on this. So <laughs> what I want to say is the other side of this, when the 15th Amendment, uh, as uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton said, shut the constitutional door for, it was uh, another, um, 30 to 40 years before there was another constitutional amendment, suffragists used this complexity and started to turn to the states. And they began to appeal to the states to amend their constitutions. And when a state amended its constitution, which started in Colorado in 1893 and culminated in New York in 1917, um, the, the women who got the right to vote got full voting rights, including for president. They weren't just voting for their state legislatures. legislators. So the women of Colorado who were enfranchised by, uh, uh, this is actually the most, one of the most important things, so you'll forgive me for oh, yeah. going on and on. Um, the women of Colorado, uh, whose uh, state constitution uh, um, uh, opened the door to them in 1893, voted for president, I think it's six times, 96, 1900, 4, 8, 12, 5, five times before the 19th Amendment was passed. 
Um, what this means is that as we come closer and closer, as we get into the 19 teens, um, something like four million women had the right to vote for president. And um, their representatives were going to be obligated to women's votes uh, in the congressional debates that passed the amendment on to the states. Uh, and um, this, this was crucial in moving the amendment forward. So, to finish, women, women's votes played a role in the women gaining the right to vote. Okay, great. So, one thing that also comes out uh, in uh, the stories of many of the women who fought for suffrage uh, is their struggles with marriage and motherhood and how that affected uh, both their ab availability uh, for suffrage work and the way they thought about uh, the project of getting women uh, the right to vote. I wondered if you could say a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, that's great. Well, um, the um, two of the suffragists of the first generation that I begin with and that you probably know about, both New Yorkers, uh, New York Staters, um, were Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. Anthony was a unmarried woman, never married. Um, Stanton uh, was married and had, wait for it, seven children. Uh, and um, uh, she was just a, I, I'm gonna write a biography of her. And um, one of the things, you know, when men's biographies are written and they talk about how there's tension between their private and public lives, it usually has to do with some sort of adultery, you know. <laughs> But the tension here is uh, that she was uh, the mother of seven. Uh, and she was, and these children were born in, uh, I don't know, 18 years, something like that very quickly. And um, she was, she, she, she gave birth pretty easily, except the last one, the seventh one. Um, she, uh, although she was born to wealth, she was married to a middle class reformer and didn't have all that much support, one or two servants, which was sort of the norm. Um, and for the whole 1850s, she couldn't really leave the house. Um, and so her partnership with Susan B. Anthony began, and Anthony, um, took her words, took them to the state legislature, took them door to door in petitions, and sometimes babysat so that Stanton could go up to the attic and write. Um, i just say one more thing about, well, two more things. One is that of her seven children, um, it, you know, there were a couple who were slightly problematic, but none seriously so. But two of her children were actually active suffragists. And I wrote a biography of her sixth child and second daughter. She had to have three sons before she had a daughter. That's why she kept turning them out. Um, <laughs> and, um, and her daughter was a major figure in the suffrage movement in the early 20th century. Her son, uh, uh, her, I think her second or third son, was a major figure in actually the European suffrage movement. Anthony did not have children, but she drew to her younger women, who she often called her suffrage daughters. Uh, and she was able, therefore, in some ways, she became the, the property of the suffrage movement in a way that Stanton did not. Stanton had children who oversaw who, who got her papers and what was said and what could be said about her, where, whereas Anthony was really, huh, uh, Oh, I was talking to Julie about this. Um, uh, um, Gertrude Stein, how many of you saw the, the, the opera? Gertrude Stein wrote an opera of her, about her called The Mother of Us All. Um, it's wonderful. So. Yeah. so, well, continuing with that theme of The Mother of Us All, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, when she agitated for the right to vote uh, at Seneca Falls in 1848. The right to vote was at the time considered perhaps the most radical of all the planks. Uh, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton in the rest of the declaration uh, talks about the subordination of women in other aspects of life, particularly in marriage, 
uh, and motherhood. So uh, she was interested not only in women getting the right to vote, uh, but women getting uh, the ability to own their own earnings if they worked outside the home. Married uh, women. Married women, exactly. Uh, or married women's ability to own property uh, or exercise legal parental authority uh, equal to that of fathers over their own children. Uh, that is, she was interested in this broader uh, legal reform agenda. Uh, that is, there were, there were many laws, uh, including uh, laws excluding women from the franchise, uh, that kept them uh, legally uh, and socially subordinate uh, in American society. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit about the relationship, both for uh, Katie Stanton, uh, between the right to vote uh, and these other forms of legal subordination, uh, and um, whether or not Susan B. Anthony and others uh, had different understandings of the right to vote in relation to these forms of subordination? Well, first of all, I would say I think one of the mistaken understandings of the women's suffrage movement is that these suffragists were single issue reformers, that all they wanted was the right to vote, and that they thought the right to vote in and of itself would fundamentally change just the act of being enfranchised would fundamentally change women's lives. In fact, um, first of all, as, as Julie says, um, uh, all the way through there's a connection between uh, votes for women and other aspects of uh, women's subordination, especially their economic and labor subordination. At the beginning of this story, women do not um, uh, no, no woman uh, goes to college, gets an advanced, gets a college degree, is a is a professional, uh, uh, has standing in a profession. Um, women can only work in a handful of jobs: teachers and um, uh, sewing, uh, manufacturing. Um, by the time women get the right to vote, women are uh, over a quarter of the American labor force. And they are, uh, and also have great, they're a majority of the, of the graduates of colleges, and also have standing in uh, the law, medicine, uh, and, and the other professions. Uh, so whereas at the beginning, suffrage is sort of at the cutting edge, at the end, it's almost uh, a final act in women's uh, public um, coming of age. Um, I want to address it in another way, which is many, I would say in some ways most suffragists had other, um, it's my nephew, hello. <laughs> um, they had other reform goals, which they thought the right to vote would be connected to. Um, one of the most interesting discoveries in my book um, is that uh, it was the temperance movement, the movement of women to control men's abuse of alcohol and their other and the domestic abuse that flowed from that, which was the first way that one would have to say average women came into the suffrage movement. Uh, they were convinced that women needed the right to vote in order to control alcohol. Um, uh, all the way through. Uh, suffragists were interested, uh, uh, they linked the right to vote to their peace concerns, their labor reforms, um, uh, reforms about um, uh, municipal government, and at the end, um, the suffrage movement in its final years, this is a funny metaphor, but gives birth to the birth control movement, um, so that it begins to generate notions about equality and emancipation in a more um, personal and private realm. So, uh, so to repeat, I, I think that, you know, the right to vote is a tool. Uh, and it is a tool that is necessary. We take it for granted. It is necessary for all social change. Uh, it doesn't make it happen automatically, but we have to use it. And uh, uh, three generations of suffragists understood that. So I hear you saying that the right to vote for, for women's right to vote was necessary, but certainly not sufficient uh, to achieve many of the reforms uh, 
uh, that uh, were necessary to improve women's lives, including uh, the reform of alcohol abuse and the institution of the saloon. And very interestingly, of course, women's movement for prohibition draws uh, many more thousands of women uh, into the movement and into the organization, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which um, you uh, talk about in the book, uh, and they achieve, or the, the, the prohibition amendment is actually achieved before the women's suffrage uh, amendment. Uh, the 18th amendment is ratified the year before uh, the, the 19th amendment uh, on women's suffrage. And so I guess uh, one thing that we can think about, I mean, and I think it relates to this earlier question as to why it takes so long uh, to get suffrage. It takes long in part because women have to convince those who already vote uh, to uh, engage in these reforms, including giving women the vote as well as temperance. And one of the uh, w arguments that I think has a lot of traction in convincing men, particularly it, with regard, because there's so much division about prohibition, uh, one of the arguments is we need the vote so that we could protect the home. We need the vote uh, so that we can uh, end the saloon as an institution. We need the vote so that we could vote for prohibition. Uh, and, and so you have these instrumental arguments where we, the right to vote is just seen as a tool for agendas that are shared by men and women alike of a particular political orientation. On the other hand, um, it seems like uh, part of what's so powerful about the struggle is that it's not just about getting other political agendas, that the vote is itself has this intrinsic, I don't want to say just symbolic, because I think it's more than a symbol, but there's something very powerful about being able to vote in terms of what it says about who you are uh, as a citizen and as a person and ha like just having equal stature uh, within a constitutional system. And, um, and I wondered, um, as you think about the different kinds of uh, women who were engaged, some of them were sing more single-minded and single-issue oriented, others thought of it as a tool, others were very interested in the powerful meaning uh, of suffrage. Uh, I w was wondering if you could say a little bit about the different kinds of personalities and strategies and approaches and how they intersected and sometimes came into tension with each other. She slipped this question in. <laughs> I prepared the other questions. Uh, uh, how shall I answer that? Um, well, I think one of the, maybe there are two uh, sets of differences. I'm not sure these are what you're talking about, but um, uh, from the very beginning, uh, or certainly uh, for the, uh, the last 50 years of the movement, there are um, tensions, um, but also sort of, um, almost collaborations uh, between uh, women who I would say are, um, they're militant in their tactics and strategies and women who are more moderate. Um, in the last years, um, many of you know about, or uh, some of you know about uh, the women who picketed the White House, got themselves arrested, um, uh, uh, were forced into, uh, uh, briefly into forced feeding uh, and um, uh, basically use civil disobedience to try and pressure um, the ruling party and the president to support suffrage. Um, I have to say when I was writing the book I was very struck with the other uh, uh, process that's going on at the same time which is an incredible lobbying process. Mm -hmm. uh, so hundreds, maybe thousands of women from every state uh, were, uh, rope, were pulled in to um, a lobbying process that was incredibly sophisticated. Uh, they would, um, uh, they learned how to uh, approach uh, Congress people, senators and representatives. They learned certain rules like uh, always knock before you enter, you never know what's going on. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, uh, as soon as you're done, go into the ladies room and write down all your notes. Um, make friends with the secretary, and uh, the most important rule was never, um, well certainly never insult, and never s do anything to get the person you're talking to to give you an absolute no. So make sure you keep the door open for the next person to come in. Uh, and um, this is a sort of quiet, sustained, but in its own way, a kind of courageous effort because they were subjected to a lot of embarrassments and humiliations and disappointments. 
So that's one answer. I think the other uh, quite different um, uh, tension, especially uh, in the last, well, throughout much of the movement, is the racial tension. And this has recently gotten a lot of attention in the public press. Um, and uh, in some ways, it's the aspect of the suffrage movement that has gotten the most attention, which I think is a little unfortunate. Um, uh, this actually spills so, into another question. Do you yeah, want to ask it? So I was actually um, fascinated by, and of course, um, you depict all the suffragists who are he heroes uh, in many respects, but also human uh, and living through historical periods uh, and making difficult choices uh, in the context of the po political realities in which they live. And I think some of those choices uh, pull some of uh, <clears throat> our suffrage heroines uh, into uh, politics that I think today we would judge to be racist. And I think that that history has uh, affected, as, we, as it well should, uh, the way that we think about uh, the legacy of suffrage on the one hand. Uh, and I wanted to actually open up this question to really think about, as we reflect on in 2020, uh, the legacy of this very long battle uh, where basically the women who started it were dead by the time the 19th Amendment uh, was ratified. It's a transgenerational struggle going through transgenerational cultural moments and transgenerational racial politics uh, where the horizons of what's politically possible are often determined by uh, a racist political and legal order. Uh, and women are trying to inch ahead uh, in the context of that uh, changing landscape. And I think you did a very beautiful job, actually, of looking at some of the conflicts uh, that these women faced and some of the divisions that the racial politics caused. And I think there's a larger question as to whether or not the racial politics actually slowed down the long battle or helped advance it. Uh, and I mean that in two ways. I mean, it could be not just that um, the opportunity uh, to play into racist politics might have led to some political gains, but also that there were moments where having moments of racial solidarity uh, and the important contributions of African-American suffragists like Ida uh, B. Wells Barnett and um, Mary Church Terrell uh, play a very important role in creating new coalitions that I think move things forward. And, um, and I wondered if you could talk about this dynamic of it, does it lengthen or um, slow things down at what particular moments? So I'll give my sh best shot at this, and then um, um, I expect maybe some of you will want to pursue this question. Um, when I think about the ways that, well, first of all, there's no question, but race and gender are constantly intertwined in this history uh, in different ways. The suffrage movement emerges, or the women's rights movement emerges, uh, in, in, the, um, in the searing fires of the abolitionist movement, its first generation, are um, learn how to do uh, reform politics as abolitionists. Another thing that I think we should acknowledge is that um, not until the amendments after the Civil War, including uh, the 14th and the 15th Amendment, which was very controversial, uh, and led to uh, really a break between the black suffrage and women's suffrage movements. Not until then, and this goes back to the point I made before, had there been any imagination that you would go to the F US Constitution, to the federal Constitution, to try to gain uh, women's suffrage. Like everything else about women's rights, it was assumed you would do it state by state. Uh, and so it is the, 14th, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, which really rewrite, in some ways, the constitutional order, which brings women's suffrage to the place that we, you know, uh, sort of um, uh, don't even notice uh, that it is risen, which is brings it to the level of national politics and constitutional change. So that is a, definitely a contribution that the politics of race brings to the politics of suffrage. Now, um, uh, by the last quarter of the 19th century, uh, begun by this conflict over the 15th Amendment, where um, one wing of the suffrage movement is enraged that um, 
the 15th Amendment forbids the states from disfranchising on the basis of race, color, and previous condition of servitude, but not sex. And, as Stanton said, the constitutional door will slam shut. I think I already said that to you. Um, and and, it, and uh, her, her rage takes a decidedly racist and elitist turn. And her, her, her language at this point is, is uh, uh, was offensive then and not just now. She spoke about Sambo. She spoke about the daughter, the, the sons of boot blacks. Um, the sons of blue, that, that's Rafi. Uh, <laughs> the sons of boot blacks getting the right to vote between, before the daughters of the founding fathers. Um, uh, so um, this has really tainted her reputation uh, and, and um, uh, really uh, helped to obscure the full range of her contributions. I have to tell you again in writing this book um, and in the next book I'm going to do, what I found is that the, this fight in 1869 over the 15th Amendment, which occurs mostly uh, the, the worst of it is between Frederick Douglass and Elizabeth Stanton. Actually, the two of them were close, were friends, and, and formed a mutual admiration society from when they first met, which was about 1841, until Douglass dies um, in 1894, something like that. Um, and um, they actually both shared a kind of elitism. They both thought of themselves as rising above the normal range of human beings, and they thought of each other that way. Um, that said, um, the, uh, uh, this racial antagonism, this, this, no, this, um, uh, this concession to the white supremacist politics of the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, not only taints the reputation of uh, the, the historical reputation of the women's suffrage movement, it was, as Julie suggests, in some ways unavoidable. It was the Democratic Party that was in full control of uh, the national government. And again, that was not our Democratic Party. It was controlled by Southerners. And uh, the president was himself a Southerner and uh, um, no friend of racial equality. Um, but it also deprived the, it, it segregated the suffrage movement. And so in some ways it deprived the suffrage movement of the insights and activism of African American women who of all people, of all women in the United States understood and appreciated the importance and power of the franchise. Uh, African American women fought for the right to vote, but they fought for the right to vote in their own organizations and sometimes against the exclusion that they faced from white suffragists. Great. So before we open it up, uh, I want to ask one last question that brings us back to the place where you started, Helen, uh, which was um, your disappointment, I think, <laughs> that we do not have. Uh, a woman president. And I think one of the conversations that suffrage began, uh, but certainly didn't solve, uh, was the question of women in politics. That is, having the vote is one thing, but getting elected is another. And I wondered if we could reflect, or if you could reflect for a moment on how suffrage uh, helps uh, put women in leadership positions, and how suffrage actually doesn't help women uh, get, into ele get elected to leadership positions. Well, actually, um, uh, holding office was not a goal of suffragists, really all the way till the end. In some ways, they abjured that because they were trying to say that they would use the vote in a kind of selfless way, that they were not personally ambitious, that they would not sell their votes for office. Uh, so it's really not until the very final years that um, any significant number of uh, women began to adv begin to advance themselves for political office, I, I should be specific, at the national level. They do begin to move into state legislat legislatures. Um, once again, then, we come back to the political parties, which were happy to claim women's votes. Um, we're happy to say that they, the Republican Party, oh no, the Democratic Party, were responsible for women getting the right to vote. Um, 
Uh, we're happy to have women's energies in uh, working for candidates, but did not allow, basically did not allow women to uh, uh, have any chance at, uh, at, at, at congressional or senatorial office. Um, so um, you can look at the book to see uh, what it looks like in the 1920s. By about 1929, there are something like 10 or 11 women in Congress, and that's the high point uh, for many decades. Uh, the Senate is an even starker um, uh, example. Um, women, uh, uh, women sometimes take, this, take the senatorial seat of their uh, dead husbands. Um, uh, Theodore Roosevelt's daughter said that uh, women tended to use their husband's coffins as, uh, uh, as uh, springboards into office. Um, but the first woman who gets and holds a seat uh, is in the 30s. She's an Arkansas woman. She's a New Dealer. Uh, she holds her seat in the Senate for, I don't know, something like 12 years and then loses it to William Fulbright. Her name is Hattie Carraway. And then the second one, Margaret Chase Smith, not until the 50s, Republican. So uh, it's, um, I, I, I should have looked at these numbers. She I don't know how long before, it takes. Right? I don't know how long it takes before there were two women at the same time. Um, so uh, um, I, I guess I think, I, I've been thinking about this because I've been thinking about writing something like, um, what would the suffragists want of us now, today? Yeah. And, I'm ambivalent because I'm, would the suffragists want us to use our votes to elect a woman? Would they want us to use our votes uh, to uh, go for certain politics? Uh, I know I want to elect a woman, I know that. So. Uh, I don't know well, if I'll have the chance, but. Well, before we open it up, just a quick comment on that. Uh, you know, the Constitution uses the word he uh, a few times to refer to the President of the United States. Uh, and to members of Congress, and that's never actually been formally amended. And I was actually sitting in a constitutional law panel, I was talking about the 19th Amendment, and one of my constitutional law colleagues said, well, of course the 19th Amendment changed that, uh, the fact that the Constitution refers to the president as a he. And of course, uh, in 1789, it's pretty clear that they meant he uh, when they wrote he to describe the president. Uh, and so it's actually a little bit of a constitutional puzzle as to whether or not, I mean, that's never been, we've never written amendments saying that we're gonna change those words to he or she. At some point, it seems like everyone understands the he president of the United States and he uh, member of Congress uh, as meaning he or she. Uh, and they it's not actually right, or they, they. Uh, but it's not really clear that it's the 19th Amendment that actually achieved that. You uh, know, as you may know, because you're a comparative uh, scholar, uh, you may know there are countries, it's either New Zealand or Australia or both, that make a distinction between what they call the active franchise, the active suffrage and the passive suffrage. And um, they, uh, their courts have ru ruled that women could gain the right to vote, but winning the right to vote did not give them the right to hold office right. and made a distinction between the two. That's never been the case uh, for us. Women have actually run for president uh, from the very corners of the society way before they had the right to vote. But. And arguably w women had the right to run for office before they had the right to uh, to vote? I mean, because the, the, the two provisions of the Constitution are just two provisions, right? There's a, met, there's a lot of office holding, uh, elected office holding, that are not the President of the United States for, or members of Congress. Uh, but I think this is a, I mean, it's a co constitutional puzzle, but I think the constitutional puzzle is uh, perhaps related to just this larger uh, problem of w women's underrepresentation in politics that the um, right to vote has some relation to but doesn't seem to directly uh, address. So um, with that, I'd love to open it up to the audience for questions. Yes. Please wait for the microphone. I think some sources have noted that once women got the right to vote, they basically voted the same as their husbands. And I don't know whether that is an accurate assessment, 
uh, or something out of the Dark Ages. Okay, uh, the whole question of how women use the right to vote after 1920 is a difficult question because um, when, how do you tell how different groups of people voted? So if you wanna tell how rich versus poor people voted or black versus white people voted, they live in different districts. So you say, oh, District 1, which is a black district, voted this way, but District 2, which is a white district, voted this way. Can't use that tool for women. So it's not until you begin to have exit polling, which is, as you know, very unreliable, in about 1940 that you begin to tell. Having said that, there are claims made immediately upon women's enfranchisement that, that exactly mirror the, the claims that were made prior to women's enfranchisement. Sometimes they were that women would vote exactly like their husbands and double their husbands' votes. Sometimes they were that women would vote exactly opposite to their husbands and thus cancel their husbands' votes. Um, uh, obviously, uh, there's no basis for any of this. We do know that something like, um, I think it's about 60 to, a, a little less than two thirds of women who were, uh, who were um, uh, um, women who, who had the right, who had, who, you know, who could vote, voted. Um, but that varied very much uh, in southern states which had voter suppression laws in place, the, uh, the percentage of women voting was very low, and not just black women, white women as well. In other states, especially with highly competitive races, the percentage of women was higher. Slowly, we do know that the percentage of women voting increases, 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 until, um, again, again, I should have checked this, I'm not exactly sure when it equals the percentage of men voting. Um, I do know that it's in the 1970s with this thing that we now know called the gender gap, in which women's votes were uh, appreciably different than men. They were more democratic, men were more Republican. They were more reform-minded, men were more conservative. But um, no, the and answer is no. And today, vote, um, rates of voting by women actually exceeds. Oh, really? Yeah, rates of voting by men. I mean, not by a huge ton, but still, I think in 2016, more women voted uh, in that election than men did, uh, or a higher percentage of women did uh, than uh, men. Yeah. Uh, back to you. I'll try to answer more succinctly. Hi. Um, I want to make a statement, and then I'm going to ask a question. Um, I think the discussion kind of erases the fact that the centennial of women gaining the vote, that only applies to white women, because black women and women of color did not receive full voting rights until much later. I just want to make, I just want to make that statement. <laughs> it's not true. I, no, that's that I, well, Native so Indigenous women did not get the right to vote until 1924. And Native black American and women. black women did not get full voting rights until the Voting Rights Act of 1964. Okay, nothing about, you are right about Native American women, but that's also true of Native American men, okay? Uh, that has to do with the changing notions of whether tribal affiliation allows you to have American citizenship rights or not. So it's not specific to Native American women. Secondly, the 19th Amendment, there were people who tried to get the word white into the 19th Amendment and failed. Nothing about the 19th Amendment explicitly limits the right to vote. Now, returning to the question of who controls the right to vote, we return to the states. And obviously, it is the case that in the southern states, controlled by white supremacist governments, uh, black women face tremendous obstacles to their right to vote, uh, which they fight, uh, and which they do not receive the kind of federal protection that, they, that the 19th Amendment would give them. They do not receive until the 1960s, when there is a voter, um, an, ins an insurgence of voter rights. Now, I'm describing women in the South, in white supremacist uh, 
states. Women in the North, whose numbers are growing after the 1920s, black women are politically active, particularly in places like Chicago and New York, where there are uh, where uh, there are well-organized African-American uh, political machines. Uh, and uh, Ida B. Wells organizes African-American women in Chicago who play a major role in electing the first black member since Reconstruction to Congress. So I would never underestimate the obstacles to voting, voter equality that African-American women and men face in southern states and continue to face, but it is, uh, it, it, it has to do with the state governments that are determined to keep them from voting. I, I, don't, I don't know how else to explain it. I don't know how to lay it at the feet of the suffrage movement itself. Okay, did you have a question? I, I, yeah, I also had a question. <laughs> 53% um, of white women voted for Donald Trump in 2016. Do you think that that was a function of them? I mean, I, pers I have my own opinion of that, but do you think that it was a function of them supporting white supremacy, or do you think something else was going on? Okay, the 53% number comes from exit polling. Again, imprecise. Uh, more recent numbers that come from the Pew Center uh, have the number between 49 and 40 percent. It's no, uh, uh, 49 and 47 percent. It's nowhere, it's much larger than the number of African American women who support Trump. Uh, it's, uh, uh, no one ever, no one ever or could ever think that women would vote as a body. They're half of the country. Um, there are conservative women. They have, fought, uh, they have fought many gains for women and for, other, and for black equality as well. However, when you have that number, you also have to ask, how does the percentage of white women who voted for Trump compare to the percentage of white men who voted for Trump? And you find that white women are more democratic and have been since the 1970s. So uh, there's no question that there are sectors of American womanhood that are, um, are motivated by racial concerns and motivated by racism and motivated by white supremacy. But we know perfectly well that people voted for Donald Trump for a whole variety of reasons. And uh, race was one, but not all of them. Um, I remember reading once that women have historically in the United States, we've gotten our rights not because of liberal ideals, but because it happened to be conservatively expedient at the time. In the case of the vote, there ha the U.S. had just experienced waves of Eastern European immigration with all these wild-eyed socialist and anarchist political ideas, and the conservative establishment males sort of felt safer in franchising homegrown, rock-ribbed, more conservative women. So but what again, do you think of that? But again, the 19th Amendment makes no such distinctions. Um, uh, there was no way to enfranchise rocked ribbed uh, um, uh, Midwestern Republican women and not enfranchise uh, Italian American New Yorkers. There was no way. Um, I personally think uh, there, we have yet to, s to be able to really prove this, but it seems to me that um, there, there might be a relationship between doubling the, uh, the electorate to women and what happened 12 years after that, uh, 20, 24, 28, four presidential elections after that, which is the Roosevelt New Deal, the Roosevelt administration, the New Deal. I think that whereas there was a tendency of women who were already alerted to the franchise uh, to vote more Republican in the 20s, uh, 
but everybody voted more Republican in the 20s. It was a Republican period. Uh, I think that by the end of the decade, um, exactly those women, the daughters of uh, 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 white immigrant men, uh, had become, uh, 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 had accommodated to the possibility of voting, and they began to vote like their fathers and brothers and husbands did that is, for the Democratic Party. So there's a little teeny bit of evidence that uh, the franchise of women um, helped to move uh, the uh, uh, democratic insurgency of the New Deal. Okay, we have time for one final question. Yes, over there. Thank you. Um, we still see the legacy of black suppression of the vote. I mean, it's still present in the South and other areas, as we've referenced. Uh, we also see far fewer women uh, running for president, maybe not this cycle, but in general. We saw a lot running. We're not seeing any winning. No, not, right. Not as many women. Do you still see, or in your research, any other areas of suppression of the woman vote in this country, or have we moved to the postmodern age where that just doesn't factor? Well, uh, most of what we know about voter suppression has to do with race and incarceration, right? Those are the two areas. Uh, but there's also something that indicates that women are, uh, have, I'm not ready to say disproportionately, but they are affected by that. Uh, women change their names upon marriage, and we know that a lot of the way, many women do, not everybody, and we know that one of the ways that voter suppression works is that they compare uh, voting uh, lists and they say, well, you know, this name is different than that name, you're out. Um, women have jobs and home uh, obligations which make it, sometimes make it hard to go to voting, uh, to, voting to the polls. Uh, so. Uh, I, Maybe it's not an accident. The leading campaigner against oppression is the great Stacey Abrams. Um, also, women are a rising percentage. They're not anywhere near the number of male felons, but they're a growing number of felons as well. Um, so um, I think there's an intersectional quality, um, to use a word, uh, an intersectional quality uh, that um, that sh we should investigate that makes gender, gender an aspect of voter suppression. And actually, the League of Women Voters, which is the um, inherited, uh, uh, the, uh, the suffrage, the, the main suffrage organization turned itself into the League of Women Voters in 1920. The League of Women Voters has taken the lead, uh, has been one of the organizations to take the lead in dealing with voter suppression. Okay, great. Well, um, we're sort of at the end of the time, and I just want to say that uh, one of the great strengths, I think, um, of your wonderful uh, book, Ellen, is that the 19th Amendment's legacy is about so much more uh, than voting. And of course, we, we should continue to think about voter suppression as a fundamental problem that goes against what the 19th Amendment was about. But I think as you tell the long history, um, it's tied to so many other social movements uh, for both racial justice and uh, women's equality defined way beyond uh, the right to vote, and uh, including office holding, we've, which we've spent um, quite some time um, talking about this evening. And I think that all of these things are brought out in the stories uh, of the women who fought the battle, and I encourage all of you to purchase the book, read the book, and engage further with Ellen um, as she'll be uh, available uh, at the program's end, which is now, uh, to sign books and continue talking. Thank you. Thank you.